Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Men's Health Week 2022 Blokes, Brains, Balls and Brawn webinar, or even Brawn and Balls webinar, or what we like to call it the four Bs, because as you can see, it can be very, very difficult to remember it in the right order. So my name's Emily Pearson, and I'm hosting the event today, and I have alongside with me today, Paul Bannister from Man Health. Uh, today is halfway through Men's Health Week almost, this is day three today, so great to see so many of you joining us for this really important topic. So we just want to give you a little bit of an introduction for those who don't know who we are, who we actually are. Paul, would you like to introduce yourself and Man Health? Good morning, everybody. Thank you ever so much for joining us on Men to celebrate Men's Health Week. It's really great to see you all. My name's Paul Bannister. I'm the founder, director of Man Health. Um, I set up Man Health after around about 2015 when I was really, really struggling with my, my depression. I felt lost and didn't know what to do with myself. Um, just re was really, really struggling to find anybody who I could reach out to. Uh, and during that dark period, I um, come up with the idea. I, I did some research, obviously, into peer support. Um, and came up with the idea of setting up some peer-to-peer peer, peer -peer support groups. Uh, and we've, we, we now run peer-to-peer -peer support groups uh, across County Durham, Wearside and Northumberland, which uh, you know, have saved possibly many, many lives over the last five or six years. And we also go into workplaces to, to support workplaces around health inequalities affecting men. Thanks, Paul. And my name is Emily Pearson. I'm the founder and managing director at Our Minds Work. Our Minds Work really exists to help organisations to embed a behaviour change model for um, mental health culture change in workplaces through a strategic approach and a range of qualifications, workshops and programmes. And Paul and I met probably around about six years ago when I was at the time working at Mind and we were introduced um, via a mutual friend and we stayed friends for a long time and we continue to have these discussions around wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do something together and obviously within that time um, I left mind set up our minds work four years ago but there was a very special moment that we encountered that really triggered a profound moment for us and I'm going to let you um, hear a little bit about the story of what happened from Paul. We were just chatting about uh, when Emily and I met this morning and realised it was six years ago. It, it doesn't feel that long. I think we had a pandemic in between, which uh, which just uh, just seems to have gone in a, in a blur for me in terms of what we were doing during the pandemic. So Emily and I was, were sat talking about possible collaboration. We were sat in Starbucks in um, County Durham. And we were just sat having a coffee and, and I, had the, uh, I was sat in my Man Health t-shirt and this gentleman approached the pair of us and just said to, said to me, are you Paul? And I said, yes. He said, uh, well, I'm from, it. Uh, I work for an organization in Newton Aycliffe and you were in doing the training a few months ago, uh, the four Bs. And I said, all right, I don't recognize you, but it's nice to see you. I hope you enjoyed the course. And he said, I did. I did really enjoy it. But after I left the course, I went, to, I made an appointment to see my GP. I went to see the GP because I, I recognised some symptoms um, that you discussed in the session. Uh, and he actually, it, it, as it followed on, he went to the hospital and he was diagnosed with stage three prostate cancer. And he told Emily, the story, Emily and I the story of how, how he'd had his prostate removed. Uh, and he was there just to, he just leant over and he just shook my hand and um, thanked me for, for raising awareness in that session because he, he said it, it saved his life. And, uh, Emily and I were both stunned and possibly burnt. We, I think we both burst into tears, didn't we? We didn't yes, know. Yes, I was definitely quite, crying at that point. We didn't quite know what to say, but it, it just reinforced the fact that, you know, we were there discussing possible collaboration and working together and taking the, the four Bs or some sort of product to, to, get, to get into the workplaces to, to help more men on the back of this, this discussion. And it just, you know, really reignited the fire to, to get this done. And, and, and that's that's how it all started. 
the pandemic slowed us down a little bit, but we we here now, and um, you know we we hoping to make a huge difference to to men across the country in the workplace. Oh, sorry about that. As, uh, when you were telling the story, actually, Paul, I got goose pimples. I get goose pimples yeah. every time I think about that moment. It was so profound. And what it led to was a realisation that if we can get this information out around men's health to increase um, health-seeking behaviours at an earlier stage, that we can actually save lives. And obviously, the the work that you do with the four B's at, at Man Health, we really took that and married it with the work that we do at Our Minds Work with our mental health advocate um, program and service blueprint and really brought them together and created the Man Health Man Ambassador program. We're really excited about it, but obviously what we want to do is tell you a little bit more about what else can it do we want to create more of these profound moments and save people's lives. So let's tell you why this is a problem. One in five British men dies before the age of 65 and often due to preventable health problems that go unvoiced. Now put your hand up if you know a man. 100% <laughs> of us in this room know a man, love a man. You know, they're very, very important parts of our lives, our husbands, our partners our brothers and fathers and it scares me to the thought that I might lose one of them before time is really up due to something that could be preventable and unfortunately men a lot of men do suffer in silence and it's time that we listened more around this and help men to increase their help seeking behavior and be more knowledgeable about these killers and their health this is a really uh, shocking statistic that over 676,000 years of life lost every year from working age men. These are our men, which I think is a really um, important statement to make. We all know men, we all love men, and every mortality is a loss to our communities, our families, and our workplaces. When we start to look into the workplace, we're going to talk about that a little bit more further on in the, um, the webinar. We do have a lot of male dominated workplaces still to this day, which unfortunately are seeing some of these problems really kind of hit home through the statistics because of the perfect storm that these organizations have and because of having very high levels of work and age males within those industries as well. So I'm going to hand over to Paul. Paul, why men? Yeah, well, why our men? Why, why are we losing so many of our men? Well, the, the, one of the things is having the Y, y chromosome. It's a, when we, our men are born with that Y chromosome, that automatically puts us at risk of certain cancers and chronic illness. Um, so, you know, when it, when it comes to the biological lottery, women are definitely the stronger sex. Uh, male specific stigma, which we, we all as men experience all the time, you, you know, you, you, you'll, you'll have heard this many, many times, probably many times over the last week, particularly about men find it very, very hard to reach out, very, very hard to go for help because the, the, the stigma that's attached to admitting that you need help or that you have a weakness. Um, we also have a syndrome that's very very apparent in men when I go and speak to men all the time I like to call it the ostrich syndrome syndrome which I think is a recognized syndrome now but when, when it comes to men and men's health men find it very very hard to reach out as I've mentioned but they also tend to ignore things and they ignore things until until it's too late so when men did like, as of the example I discussed earlier when men do reach out it's often too late, particularly with, with, with cancers, as you know, if you, you, you catch the cancers earlier, then you, you, know, you have better outcomes. So it's that stigma to reaching out. They don't want to be seen as weak. They don't want to be seen as needing help. They like to solve the, they are, they, they, they like solution-based problems. They like to solve the problems themselves. And with many of these health illnesses, they can't. And ignoring them is, 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 is not, the, not the way to do it. So aversion to help sink behavior, I've touched on that as well. You know, men, men just do not like 
to, to reach out. And it's very, very important. And it's, it's the, the workplace programs and initiatives. You, you, you know, all these, these initiatives that go on now about men speaking up. I've got to, I really want to challenge that, you know, because it's not working. Men are not going to speak up when it comes to mental health or physical health. They're just not going to do it. We need to come up with programs or, or, or ways that we can take take initiatives to the men, whether it be, you know, whether it be at their place of work, whether it be in the community, because men are not going to reach out and ask for help. That's, we're not conditioned to do it. Our society has trained us not to do it. So we need to really, really change that culture. We, we all, all know if you've, if, you, if you've, we hear about men, men drink way more alcohol than women. Men use all these sort of masking strategies when it comes to stress. So it's alcohol, drugs, risky behaviors, all these sort of things that, that men would resort to, whether it be gambling or anything, just to just to strategies, just to avoid, you know, avoid having to confront the actual issue. And then this is one thing I talk to, uh, to the guys all the time about. Um, it's, it's men, and I say this openly, and I, and I think I can say it as a man, as, as a man, man, men are absolutely useless at being able to risk assess their physical and mental health. They just don't know how to do it. They just haven't got the, they, they haven't got the expertise. They're not conditioned to do it. So they, they aren't able to do it. So, you know, and, and, I, and I can say that because I, I, I was really, really poorly with my mental health. And, you know, I was on suicide ideation and I, and I didn't even realize I was that poorly. You know what I mean? And it, it just, it, I just sort of allowed it to sneak up on me. And it's just, it's, and I wasn't able to risk assess how poorly I was, you know what I mean? And, and that's, that's, that's quite common in men, um, you know, and they'll, you know, phys physical health as well, they'll ignore the symptoms as well and that you know the, the guy the guy who came to, to see us in starbucks that day i once delivered a health session to to a prison officer um and he said to me and we were talking about the prostate and, the, and going to the toilet during the during the night and i said to me you, you, you shouldn't go if you're going to the toilet more than two or three times a night then you need to go and get checked out and this guy said to me well i go 13 times a night to the toilet and i was like you know, in 13 times a night you're going to the toilet, surely you must have realized that there was some sort of issue. And, you know, he just shook his head. So it's, it's, that, it's, it's that sort of thing that I'm confronted with all the time when I go into workplaces. It's just a lack of understanding and, and, and a real lack of awareness around physical and mental health. Thanks, Paul. And, you know, we are using the term men of what we mean is, is many men. There is a bell curve to this, as we know that there is a higher risk of men, but not all men will, will experience these things, but the vast majority of them will. So just to make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're talking about many men, but sometimes it's hard to say many men, many men over and over again during a talk like this. So when we're just talking about men in general, so let's have a little bit of a poll to see if you actually know what the five biggest killers are. So you're going to see a poll um, pop up on your screen in a moment. We launch the poll. There we go. So what are the five biggest killers of working age men? And you've got 10 options you can choose from. Let's see if you know what the five biggest killers of working age men actually are. Just give you a few moments to select all five that you think are the five biggest killers. Okay, we've got 50% participated. It's going up, 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 up. Let's see if you get them right. This is actually really interesting to see straight away. So I'm just going to end the poll. Um, oh, there's a few more people polling there. This is actually really, really interesting to see. And one of them has really jumped out to everybody in the room. And a lot of people think that this probably is the biggest killer. Um, what you'll see today is actually it's not the biggest killer. Yeah, what we've got here is the majority of people think that 
um, it's definitely one of them. So I'll just end that poll there and I'll just share the results with you. So what you can see here is 98% of people in the room said suicide. We hear this all the time, don't we? We hear about male suicide, you know, the, it's male suicide rates are three times higher, um, in, especially in the UK, in some of the workplaces, it becomes much higher than that, especially in things like the construction industry and the logistics industry. And it's not even the biggest killer. There are bigger killers, which we're gonna to talk to you about here, but nevertheless, still a warm, very, very preventable, and we need to do more about it. We then have 84% of said heart disease, 90% uh, of said prostate cancer, 68% of said bowel cancer, 68% of said testicular cancer as well. So actually you've got some of them right, some of them wrong. So let's find out what they actually are. Paul, I'm going to hand this one over to you. And we're going to count them down, starting with number five. Interesting to see on the poll, Emily, um, the, 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 the results are there. And most people saying suicide was the biggest killer of working age men. So when we put this program together, we obviously it, it was a work-based program, the 4B. So we wanted to con concentrate on the five biggest killers, preventable killers of working age men. And suicide is, is a big killer of working age men. In fact, it's the most common killer of men aged under 50 and they're not wanting to belittle in any way the number of men who lose their lives to suicide but usually about 4,200 men lose their life to suicide and when you think I think last year the overall number of deaths by men was 265,000 which was very very similar to the, the number of deaths by women in the, in the scale of things the, the suicide was only only accounted for 4,000 of them deaths the problem with suicide is, particularly in men, it's, it's very, very difficult, you know, very, very difficult with men to pick up any symptoms when it comes to depression or mental health issues, particularly in the workplace. So, I mean, I thought it would very, very would be interesting for you today to just to just to, for me to talk about some of the things that in, in the workplaces that you need to watch out for with men. Um, so, as I said, the, the, the group that's most at risk from suicide are men aged between 40 and 49. We are losing way too many men to suicide. We're losing probably, you know, the, the, on average, 13 to 14 men a day to suicide. And that's the ones that are, the, 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 the coroner decides are suicide. So it's probably slightly more. Um, so it's, it's something that needs to be done about. It's something that's not been addressed in this country whatsoever, but it's, it's something that's very, very hard, particularly in the workplace, to pick up with men. Uh, and you, 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 the signs you probably need to watch out for with men in the workplace are things like men totally withdrawing in the workplace, men being obstructive in the workplace, men being, you know, um, you know, argumentative in the workplace would possibly something you need to watch out for uh loss of interest in work someone who's probably a really good diligent worker who's, who suddenly is, is, is making mistakes and, and, and not doing mistakes someone whose mood changes very very fast um and, and, and particularly with men which the key thing is uh, mental health issues often manifest themselves in men in, in physical symptoms I know from, from my experience, I was experiencing a lot of irritable bowel syndrome, a lot of headaches uh, when, I, when I was, that's what I was complaining about at work. And it was just basically me trying to disguise the fact that I was struggling with my mental health. And, then, and the, what you'll find in the workplace is many, many men will use that, them sort of physical symptoms to describe the fact of, of, of how they're really, really feeling. Because one, they don't have the language to the, the ability to uh, to be able to understand that it's a mental health issue, and secondly, they don't have the language or they, they're not articulate enough to be able to explain how they're feeling. So that's the depression and suicide. So that's the fifth biggest killer of working age men. The next biggest killer of working age men is bowel cancer. Uh, bowel cancer begins in the large bowel and is sometimes called colon or rectal cancer because it can be. In there and it's the fourth biggest killer. 
54% of bowel cancer cases in the United Kingdom are preventable. So a lot of this, it's, you can be predisposed to bowel cancer, but a lot of it, the studies now saying it's down to lifestyle choices. So again, um, we, you know, with 67% of men in this country being obese, uh, there's an issue around lack of diet, poor diet, lack of exercise, um, you know, too much alcohol, you know, too many drink, drinking too much. So it's something that we need to really, really be aware of. Um, so we're losing about 8,500 men a year to bowel cancer. Uh, you, you may well know. Um, so bowel cancer is the third most common cancer in the United Kingdom, 13% of all male new cancer cases. There is a screening process in place now for through the NHS, which is the only screening in place for, for men. Uh, and that on your 55th birthday, you get invited in for a bowel cancer screening, which, which I've been in and done. I asked the question when I was there to the, to the doctor supervising the session and said, how many men are turning up for this free bowel cancer screening that could potentially save their lives? That would be an interesting question to ask you all. Um, but the answer that, that answer I was given was, that, and this has been going about three or four years now, uh, the answer I was given was that about 28% of men are accessing that free bowel cancer screening. So again, quite clear that men are avoiding, uh, you know, it, it's something that could save their lives, which is, which is really, really worrying. So that's bowel cancer, which is the fourth biggest killer. Third biggest killer of working age men, used to be the second biggest killer, but it's now the third biggest killer is lung cancer. So you can see lung cancer develops when there are uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells inside one or both lungs, and these cells grow to form tumors. So one in 13 males are diagnosed with lung cancer in their lifetime, okay? Obviously, with the decrease in industrialization and the, you know, the awareness around health and safety, lung cancer incidents are falling. Uh, and obviously the, the, the work done by successive governments around the smoking ban has increased, decreased the number of lung cancer incidents. But the worrying thing is that still we still have over 6,000 people a year in the United Kingdom diagnosed with lung cancer who've never ever smoked a cigarette. So, you know, it's not just smoking related that causes lung cancer. Yeah. So around 21,000 men a year die from lung cancer in the United Kingdom. So as you can see, we've moved from the, you know, the number of people dying from bowel, suicide to bowel cancer to lung cancer, increasing the numbers every, every, through with every ailment. Um, you know, so again, more men smoke than women, so, and they smoke more hand-rolled tobacco, so it puts them at risk uh, with lung cancer. Again, lung cancer, very, very hard to detect as well. Sorry, sorry, Emily, very, very hard to detect. Um, and one of the symptoms which is associated with lung cancer is persistent cough. Well, we, we'll you'll know through the pandemic, one of the, ones, one of the symptoms of long COVID, which incidentally impacted more on men in this country than women with over 18% more men dying from COVID related illnesses than, than women. So again, that was down to underlying health conditions. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so that, that's lung cancer. Um, so we move on to the second biggest killer of working age men, which is prostate cancer, okay? It affects one in 12 men in this country uh, with about 9,500 men losing their lives to prostate cancer every year, okay? So uh, when, I, when I go and deliver this session in the workplace, I always start delivering this session by asking the men in the workplace, and I've done this hundreds of times with hundreds of men, I ask them three questions. What is the prostate? What does it do? And where's it at? And I've never, ever had a man, which is really shocking, really, considering it's the second biggest killer, could answer the three questions completely answer them. The, the lack of awareness around what the prostate gland is and what its purpose is, is it's, it's just, it, it never ceases to amaze me. They just have no awareness. One of the biggest things about the prostate cancer is that, you know, 
the men's aversion to go and get it checked out because they, they have this idea that the first thing the GP is going to do is do the digital rectal examination, which is not, not, not quite true. Uh, a lot of GPs would, would do a PSA test and, and men aren't aware of that. So that's, that's prostate cancer. Okay, it affects one in 12 men, more than 47,000 people, 47, people diagnosed in Britain every year of all ages. So we're losing 32 men a day. Okay. So by far the biggest killer of working age men is heart disease. Okay. So heart and circulatory disease is an umbrella term for all diseases of the heart and circulation. Okay. It kills one in six UK men and about 4 million men and 3.6 million women living with a diagnosis of heart or circulatory problems in this country. It can be predisposed to heart disease. If you've got a history of heart disease in the family, but a lot of it is down to lifestyle choices. And again, 67% of men in this country are obese. Uh, one in four men drink in excess of the government's alcohol guidelines. Um, you, know, you know, men aren't getting out and doing the, the two and a half hours of exercise a week generally. Uh, you know, so all in, in, the, in the poor diet. So there's all these things lead to high incidence of heart disease. And it is by far the biggest killer in the Western world. And it's mainly down to lifestyle choices. So there's the five biggest killers in a nutshell. And that's what we talk about when we go into the workplaces and we talk about the symptoms and we try and encourage men to take responsibility for their own health and well-being. Um, and you, you say the lack of knowledge around the five biggest killers and generally the lack of knowledge around men's health it never, it, it, I'm, it, I'm never surprised by it. I'm just shocked by it every time I go in. Thanks, Paul. I know Lorraine's just put a question in the chat box there around prostate cancer. Uh, I thought the prostate cancer incidence was one in eight or one in four in certain ethnicities. You said one in 12. Does that mean the incidence is getting better? I'll just have to check that figure, Emily, because they're the latest figures that I've got. But um, Yeah, I've yeah, just yeah. had a little check actually on Cancer Research UK and it says exactly what we've just said there. And that was mm -hmm. the latest statistics was 2018 on there. Yeah. Um, so prostate cancer is the most common cancer of, of men in yeah, the but, UK, around 52,300 new cases every year. What I will say, Emily, is that the fact that um, Prostate Cancer UK have done a, a fantastic campaign over the last six six months, and they've done a prostate checker onto their, onto their website that's been accessed by thousands and thousands of men. And it asks men three questions about the prostate. And if they answer three questions, it tells them they're, they're at risk. And I think I was reading a, a, an article the other day where it's something like 45,000 men have, have subsequently gone and, and, and had the prostate checked because of that prostate checker, yeah. which is on the Prostate Cancer UK website. So that's yeah. something I'll be encouraging all men to go onto that site and, and do, the, do the quick uh, answer the questions. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Paul. So... Why are we talking about men in, at work today as well? As you can see, those five biggest killers put men at higher risk than women. And when it comes to many workplaces, they do have, we do have industries, departments um, that are at higher risk because they're very male dominated. In the construction industry, um, the suicide actually kills more men than falls from height, which was the most the biggest killer of construction workers from health and safety perspective. And it actually means that the construction industry has the highest suicide rates um, per any industry in the UK. We can also say that HGV drivers had a suicide rate 20% higher than the national average as well. And this is because we see, obviously, men are at higher risk of suicide due to the means that they use and the, um, the, how quick they can be. The fatality rate is very, very high due to that, where women take, attempt to take their own lives at a much higher rate than men do. But usually the means, mean, the means that they use can mean that there's a space of time where support can be given to help them to um, prevent that, that death by suicide actually happening. So 
when it comes to, to men as well, as we've talked already, it goes unvoiced, it's not risk assessed. And we're seeing that this is having huge impacts in the workplace. And because we know that men are at higher risk of these five biggest killers, as well as suicide, we can also start to look at the risks of the industry and the work that they're doing. You know, HGV drivers, general kind of drivers, the industry is still very male dominated. They're sat in a truck or a van all day long, very sedentary, puts them at higher risk of heart disease as well. So there are all of these perfect storm situations that unfortunately we are seeing much, much higher risk within some of these industries themselves. So, you know, we wanna really help organizations to tackle this um, because these are our men. We need to make sure that we're providing that information and getting out there to the guys so that we do have more of those profound moments that we had in Starbucks. And Paul and I can't travel around the world doing that. And actually, as a woman, it's not my place, I don't think, to um, be out there talking to men from a peer to peer perspective. This is why it's so important that we're looking at reaching men in a little bit of a different way. And one of the reasons for the Man Health Man Ambassador Programme is this is a brand new initiative that engages men in the workplace in a very, very different way. And what we've done found in our research is that there are actually quite a number of barriers that a lot of workplaces are beginning to see because their current mental health and well-being strategies are actually disengaging for men rather than engaging them. And let's find out from a little bit of a poll to see how your health initiatives are engaging your male workforce. So we've got another little poll coming up. And the question is, I'll just relaunch this. What problems are you currently experiencing when engaging your male workforce and in health initiatives? Is it that your health initiatives are generic and don't target men? Maybe that's the support offered isn't tailored to men. And as we know through research, men are less likely to attend talk and treatments and therapies that can be very, very direct. Talk about your problems. Um, however, you know, it is beginning to increase as we're tackling the stigma of that. Um, but a lot of the support offered can really just be set up in a way that doesn't engage men. Male workers are harder to reach. They're out there, they're, they're very remote. They're not generally sat at desks quite often. It becomes harder to actually get out to them, um, especially if you send in communications via emails or on an intranet page, that might be harder for them to, to access. Try to engage the male workforce, but it didn't work or something else. Feel free to pop it in the chat box what it is. You know, I spoke to an HRD literally just yesterday and said, it's Men's Health Week this week, you know, what are you doing around men's health? And they said to me, we did men's health last year, nobody turned up for the sessions, so we're not doing it again. This is one of the biggest problems that many men report to us is, um, and through the research, is that they're not repetitive messages that build trust. Um, it's a tick in the box. We did Men's Health Week, it didn't work. However, you, we still have these risks there. We still have to find new ways to reach our men out in the workplace. So let's have a look. We've got quite an interesting mix here. I'm just gonna end the poll and share the results. So we've got the highest one, 32, 34% male workers are harder to reach. Absolutely. Does that mean that we shouldn't attempt to do it or find new ways to do it? Try to engage the male workforce, but it didn't work. Again, do we just leave it there or do we keep banging the drum, shouting the message, really kind of having these repetitive messages and building that trust for our male workforce to actually um, start to engage? You know, one of the things about the difference between many men and women is women are great at starting movements. You know, look at the menopause movement. It is so, so important that we raise awareness of the impacts that the menopause 
can have on many women that can affect their mental health, their physical health and well-being that were going unvoiced. Now look at where we are with that. And this has been built into workplace strategies and initiatives and it's ongoing. These ongoing messages are, are constantly being repeated. Men are not great at really shouting about, I want improvements for me. Um, so maybe we need to, to, to listen a little bit more to what that's telling us and how do we, we get around some of those barriers. 20% said health initiatives are generic and don't target men. So we've seen this with a lot of health initiatives in the workplace. You generally tend to find in many workplaces that they're very female led. Um, lots of women you know, really, really, again, really good at getting out there, you know, wanting to, to engage in this, and we don't see as many men doing that. Um, got, oh, support offered isn't tailored to men, so the additional support available isn't really tailored to men. That can be disengaging for men. Um, what you might know if you've done any kind of marketing um, knowledge before, is that when we need to market something to target a particular group of people is we need to make it engaging for them by understanding the people who we're trying to reach in our audience. We need it to be engaging because, oh, that's about me. I need to go and pay attention to what this says. And then something else. So we will have a little look in the chat box as well to see what's in there. Uh, what have we got? Yeah, so men need to talk to men. Absolutely, Helen. We need positive male role models who are out there, you know, really showing the power of it's okay to seek support. It's okay to go through these things. The most important bit is, is that you're alive and you're here for the people who love you and, you know, want you to be here. So, uh, Laura... I make myself available one-to-one -one appointments and surgeries. This seems to work a lot better. Yeah, brilliant, great idea there. We're an all-female HR team, which is definitely our barrier. Absolutely, Claire. We hear that reported quite often. Completely agree. We need men speaking to other men. Some really great examples in there that we really need to pay attention to because it has come along a lot in the research that we've done as well. So some of the barriers that we've just talked about there men do present differently to women when it comes to the health and well-being and we do know that so we've got to see these barriers and start to break them walls down we've talked about male specific stigma it needs to be tackled to increase health seeking behavior and as a woman i don't understand male specific stigma but this is one of the reasons why we need men to be really positive role models to really tackle that male specific stigma from a man's perspective and show that sponsorship and leadership for men's health. Again, most workplace initiatives can be quite generic or run by a lot of female employees. Most men aren't engaged in current workplace initiatives, so we have seen that they are harder to reach, harder to engage. But this is because they've been very tick box men's health week let's do something about it and then it doesn't get talked again for another another year or we're doing more november and then it doesn't get talked about for another year targets mental and physical health of the most at, so it doesn't target mental and physical health of the most at risk groups and the man ambassador program that we've designed is actually designed to reach out to men which again paul mentioned before you know, waiting for men to reach out for help when they're already at crisis leaves them at risk of not reaching out at all or reaching out when it's far too late. And we see this with some of the cancers at stage four before they, they reach out to help. You know, this is um, this my kind of case of we need to stop. Heard this, probably all heard this uh, terminology many a times. We need to stop just focusing on pulling people out the river. We've got to go down the river and figure out why people have fallen in in the first place and in reaching to men rather than waiting for them to reach out. And the power of male peer, the peer engagement is really important as well, um, as we've seen through some of the comments that you've made there. So how can workplaces improve men's health at work? We do have five top tips 
for focusing on men and prevention. You know, if these are things that you can do on your own, but if you are looking at a program that we can come and embed into your workplace so that you have a fully functioning, safe um, program in place to engage your men with these five biggest killers, um, then, you know, get in touch with us and I'll send you some information after the, the webinar today. So five top tips. Number one, language and imagery make it about men and accessible to them. What we generally find is that many women are interested in everything. Yeah, women are very good at thinking, about, oh, that's for my sister, or actually my dad would really like that, or actually that's maybe something that's connected to my daughter. And we're very, very good at looking at everything and thinking about the people in our lives. Unfortunately, men don't really do it that way. So many men need that really direct approach to this is about you, this is for you. And we can think about how we do that through the language that we use and the imagery that we use as well. Promote positive action for health that impacts their loved ones. And, you know, this is a message that has been used for a very, very long time when it comes to health promotions. This is more around, you know, men are still seen quite often as the providers and see themselves as that. These masculinity norms, we need to really hone in on them so that we can help many men to engage in health seeking behavior because they want to be around for their loved ones. And the impact that it, that could have on the people that they love um, can be a really powerful message that engages men to seek help. And we probably hear this quite a lot. Um, and Paul, I know that you will agree with this, that you hear a lot of the men that attend the man health groups, they've been sent there or at least had a little bit of a prod to get there by their, their loved ones and the people who care for them. Would you agree with that one, Paul? Yeah, certainly. I, the, the amount of phone calls I get on a daily basis from, uh, from, from, from mothers, from sisters, you know, from, even from daughters, just, just saying, what can we do to help? You know, how can we get our, our father, our, our brother to access, you know, help? And it's, 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 it's a regular thing. And it's, it's really, really worrying that, that, that men just, again, take, don't want to take responsibility for, for their own mental health. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, absolutely. And that our, takes our point three, which is something that Jamie's just mentioned there about the role modeling. The role modeling and this lad culture, unfortunately, is being mm -hmm. a little bit off. We need to promote healthy role modeling within the the man-to-man -man space and make yeah. sure that that male sponsorship and peer-to-peer -peer advocacy is based on help seeking behaviors being healthy achieving mental and physical fitness because of these things because this is the strength this is the masculinity rather than that lad culture of how many pints can you drink um, which jamie's just mentioned in the comments there so it really links into that Build trust, repeat messages and promote confidentiality. There's loads of research out there that many men need these messages for them to engage in an initiative, a program, a service, so that we're not just ticking a box and hearing about men's health once a week, once a year. This is about repeating those messages and promoting confidentiality. This is a huge fear for many men that, and for a lot of people actually in general, in fact, for everyone, that their confidentiality is going to be breached. The only time we should ever be breaching confidentiality is if there's a safeguard in the issue and we need to keep people safe at risk of significant harm. Male friendly activities and indirect messaging. Uh, a lot of the campaigns around mental health, you know, time to talk day, come and sit down with a cup of tea and a piece of cake and talk about your mental health. You know, this is sometimes a little bit too direct for many men. What men, many men like to do is to engage in more kind of activity based um, initiatives and programs, physical activity, problem solving and have that indirect messaging connected to it. So as an example, you know, heart disease awareness day, you could actually organize something like a rugby match or a football match between two departments in the organization for an hour. 
and that give that indirect messaging about how physical activity is good for the heart, good for physical health. And, you know, here's a little leaflet to take away with you at the end of the session. Take it to the men is number six. And I've mentioned this already. We've got to reach out to men and not be waiting for them to reach out once they're at crisis. This is just some of our top tips that you can take away and do yourselves. Or if you are looking for some support with that, please do get in touch and we can give you more information about the Man Health Man Ambassador Programme. Paul, over to you. Actually, some great points raised there in terms of men. Men are really, it's a real challenge to, to reach these men. And I always say, say you've got to be persistent. If someone's, when these wives or these mothers call me, I'll say be persistent, really constantly. I hesitate to use the word nag, but really, really, you've got to be pushed. Some of the men have got to be really, really pushed to access the support that we offer. And the hardest thing for any man coming to any male peer support group is attending that first meeting. It's just uh, it's such a challenge for them. And, I, and, and I've been known to stand outside meetings and, and drag men in because they've just, you know, been walking past and, and tried to avoid coming in and you've just got to get out there and drag them in. So it's a real, real challenge to reach these men. Uh, and for men to reach out is a real, real challenge. So how do you, how do you help the, these male employees in your workplace? By developing a healthy workplace, by embedding a mental health and well-being strategy that creates a culture where all employees can feel cared for. When I speak to HR people and I speak to people who are in charge of well-being, I always ask them, did you involve the men in the process of developing your well-being strategy? Did you go and ask the men what they wanted to see? And in, in, invariably, the, the answer comes back is no, that we didn't. It's something that's been imposed onto them. And there's still a culture of in the workplace of the, the them and us with the men. They still see the management, the HR as them against us. And we, we need to break down that barrier. We need to involve men in all these workplace initiatives. And we need to feel that they, you know, they, they really, really, we really want them to get well. We really want them to, 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 to be cared for. We want them to be, you know, to, to, to speak out when they're struggling. Um, and I saw this statistic the other day that saying men are often in crisis before they reach out in the workplace and, and that we've got to change that. We, we've, we've got to be much more proactive and that involves, that means involving men in the workplace and in all these health place initiatives in, in reaching out to them, seeing what, what it is that works for them. And, and I'm going to say this last line, but it's, it's, it's really, really common sense. You know, your most valuable asset has got to be your employees. And I think since the Great Reset during the pandemic, many, many employees, employers are starting to realize this now. We're finding it very, very hard to recruit staff. Uh, and when you've got staff, you know, recruitment is a great cost. You want to keep them. You know, you want them to remain loyal to you. Well, how do you, how do you, how do you keep your staff? You look after them, all right? You care for them. You know, you make them feel as if they are, you know, wanted. And they'll become more loyal to you, more trusting, and you will increase productivity. So again, they're teaching you all to suck eggs there. But you know, if you've got a predominantly male workforce and you're not engaging them, then you need to do something about it. I think this is just our final part and um quote really is that I think it's very very clear that we need to do better just need to do better in general of raising awareness around men's health um, in our families with you know our loved ones but in a lot of workplaces we potentially have um, millions and millions and millions of men who we can actually reach through the Man Ambassador Programme. So let's do better in our workplaces. Let's make it easier for men to seek the help they need. Let's all be Man Ambassadors today and take some of these messages forward back into our workplaces. And we could potentially create more of those Starbucks moments and save people's lives. It's time to listen to what's going on uh, with regards to the barriers that men are experiencing and definitely do better. Okay, thank you very much for attending today.
I will send you over some information on the Manbassador program so that you have it available. And what I'll do is I'll just pop a little link into my diary if you would like to have a 30 minute catch up to hear more about the Manbassador program and how it can be embedded in your workplace to create a team of men in the workplace who are out there breaking down these barriers and increasing help seeking behavior around the five biggest killers of men. Okay, any final questions before we leave to enjoy the rest of our day? Let's have a look. Thank you everyone for um, engaging in that chat box. Some really, really important points in there, Helen, absolutely trying to ring the GPs and get into the GPs right now is really, really challenging and difficult. Absolutely. My husband's gone through a health problem at the moment and it's been really, really stressful for him just trying to get anybody to, to pay attention to what's going on. So absolutely, really, really awful to hear some of the stories in there. Um, great. Jamie, you know, thank you for sharing your own experience and the challenges that you've had um, from uh, fr and the support that you've, you've gained at the workplace by being able to open up. So absolutely, we know that we can help people. Um, we've got to get to that point where men feel able to do that though. Jenny, although something I hear from my male clients is at times it's easier to talk to a woman, although they agree that men do talk differently to other men than they do women. You know, it's really interesting one, isn't it? And I think it is, again, very, very individual. I had a chat with um, a male psychotherapist actually about this, and I asked them the question around, you know, do you think that men find it easier to speak to women? And or is it men find it easier to talk to men? And again, I think it's about the individual and their, um, how they've been brought up and the male and female role models that they've had in their lives, which will determine that. But also, I suppose there's a difference in the work that's being done. Is it you know men talking to men just about their own health? Or is it women talking to men about their health. So I think sometimes the initiative is a really important part of, um, of, of connecting men to men at the right stages as well. Some really great points in there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, oh, lots of thank yous. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much.